Speaking of sports, I want to talk a little bit about sports this morning. And uh, we're joined by a fascinating guest. Doug Gladstone is with us this morning. Doug is the author of a book called A Bitter Cup of Coffee. Here to tell us now about uh, about something that has been going on with Major League Baseball that, uh, on on the surface anyway, seems like a very unjust thing. And Doug has written this book about it called A Bitter Cup of Coffee. Doug, good morning. Welcome to Seize the Day. How are you? Good morning, Gus. Thank you very kindly for having me on the show. I appreciate it greatly. You're very welcome. Now, Doug, uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you came to write a book about Major League Baseball, their pension system, and 872 lost souls in this big uh, in this big machine. Well, in the interest of full disclosure, um, I am a retirement system uh, public information officer here in New York, and I was sitting around the house one day thinking about the 40th anniversary of what uh, we in New York still refer to as the imperfect game. That, of course, for you and your listeners who don't know, was the day um, you know, on July 9, 1969, when a little-known Cubs rookie, Jimmy Qualls, lined a clean single into left field with one out in the top of the ninth inning to break up Tom Seaver's attempt uh, for a no-no. And, of course, in the storied history of the New York Mets franchise, there has never been a perfect game or a no-hitter thrown. So I got to thinking uh, on the 40th anniversary of this um, game back uh, two years ago uh, that, well, Jimmy Qualls, no one really knows about him. Tom Seaver was a first ballot Hall of Famer. And in the course of interviewing Mr. Qualls for a Baseball Digest story that was ultimately published in September 2009, he very casually, very innocently, very innocuously, just like you and I are talking now, told me that he doesn't get a pension. And, of course, um, I know a little bit about pensions because of my uh, work here in New York. And I just asked him very obviously, why not? And he proceeded to tell me that, uh, for the benefit of you and your listeners, uh, between 1947 and 1979, there were, oh, in 2000, there were 1,063 men who did not meet what you needed at that time to qualify for a pension, which was four years. Um, now, to flash forward a bit, to fast forward a bit, rather, in 1980, the rules changed. The rules changed so that ever since 1980, for the past three decades plus, all you've needed is one game, that's right, one game um, to qualify for health insurance and 43 game days to qualify for a retirement annuity. And while that is great ever since 1980, um, Major League Baseball and the Players Association didn't have the wisdom to retroactively amend all those men like Jimmy Qualls or like um, David Clyde, the flamethrower for the Texas Rangers, who is now the pitching coach for the Houston Miracles. Um, and down in your way, I think, in, uh, in Tampa, uh, the executive director of the Clearwater for Youth, Hank Webb. Hank Webb pitched for the New York Mets and the L.A. Dodgers. Hank Webb doesn't get a pension. So I thought that was an inequity and an injustice, and it hadn't been reported on. And me being a big baseball fan, I've loved the game ever since my late father, God rest his soul, took me to my first game in 1967. Um, I wanted to try in my own small way to do something about that, to give these men the social redress that clearly had not been proffered to them. Douglas Gladstone is with us this morning. His book is called A Bitter Cup of Coffee, How MLB and the Players Association Threw 874 Retirees a Curve. And you can find that, by the way, on my website at gusloyd.com. If you just go to my website, click on the Books tab at the top of the page, you can, I've got a little Amazon widget thingy there, and you can uh, you can click on A Bitter Cup of co- uh, Coffee take a look at it. And I tell you, it's a fascinating book. And let me just say this too. You don't necessarily have to be a baseball fan to enjoy this book because uh, it really is a book, as you say, about you know addressing a wrong in a system. But if you are a baseball fan, it's even it's it's really great. You're going to be uh, you're going to be recalling all kinds of great memories that uh, Doug brings up in the book, A Bitter Cup of Coffee. Let's talk for just a, a moment here, too. For those maybe who are not familiar, Doug, with baseball parlance, why the name of the book? Why is it called A Bitter Cup of Coffee? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the props and the kind words. Um, 
Bitter Cup of Coffee goes back in the lexicon to 1908. Uh, it was for, first came in the um, in a story about the then uh, New York Giants. Um, according to the dictionary, it is to describe a period in which anyone, but particularly a September call-up, a September call-up to the big leagues, who doesn't have a lot of time um, in the major leagues, uh, get their feet wet, as it were. Um, and we've used a cup of coffee really in business. Uh, how many of us know people who are in and out of the uh, private sector for, say, three, four years? They had a cup of coffee in the workplace. Um, I, of course, believe that the experiences of these men was not sweet uh, because of this tension issue. It was bitter, and that's how the title uh, came to be. There you go. Uh, yeah, a cup of coffee, a euphemism for somebody who comes up and spends a very short period of time playing in the major leagues. I mean, we, you know, we, in fact, in the book, you recall, uh, I know one guy in particular who came up, played one game, one game in the majors, and that was it. And nowadays, if that were to happen, as Doug said a little bit earlier, if somebody got called up and they played one game, one day in the majors, they would be eligible for health insurance, uh, you know, uh, benefits. Whereas back in this time period, uh, these guys were kind of left to hang out to dry. Now, one of the interesting things about the book, too, Doug, is that this this uh, issue was addressed, especially with the Negro League players many years ago. So tell us a little bit about that and why this didn't get addressed on the whole with all former Major League players. That, that's correct, Gus. In 1993, as you correctly note, Major League Baseball, uh, to their credit, did a very magnanimous thing with a great gesture. Uh, most of the veterans of the Negro Leagues, obviously, I don't have to give you and your listeners a, um, a, a lesson in American history, but baseball was just a mere institution for the social segregation that was going on in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And a lot of talented um, African-American men were robbed of the opportunity to play uh, Major League Baseball uh, because of that segregation. So, in 1993, uh, Major League Baseball, as I said, props to them, did a wonderful thing. They gave uh, 39 veterans of the Negro Leagues and their spouses health insurance for life. And then in 1997, perhaps to coincide with the 50th anniversary of Jackie Robinson uh, breaking the color barrier, uh, in uh, January of that year, they decided to give 29 veterans of the Negro Leagues um, life annuities, I won't call them pensions because that's not what they are, uh, but they were life annuities totaling uh, $7,500 to $10,000 a year. Uh, that class was later expanded to 89 men um, in 2004. The financial stipulations uh, were a tad different. It was $40,000 um, for four years or $350 a month for life. The key point was, Gus, you didn't have to play Major League Baseball. Now, again, um, to correct a social inequity, I'm all for it. Um, you would probably know better than I. In the book of Matthew, it says we shall be judged by what we have done for the least of us. So, I, again, props up, thumbs up to Major League Baseball. The problem is the men who I wrote about, such as a David Clyde, such as a Jimmy Qualls, um, they had legitimate contractual employment relationships with the league. The veterans of the Negro Leagues, by and large, did not. So if you were going to extend benefits and retirement annuity payments to the veterans of the Negro Leagues, the least you can do is also offer those comparable and similar benefits or more to the men who had legitimate employment contractual histories with Major League Baseball. That hasn't been done. Um, this pa uh, last April 21st, however, Major League Baseball decided finally, finally after three plus decades, to throw these men that I wrote about a bone. It, it was the ultimate act of appeasement. They decided to give these men $625 for every quarter of service up to 16 quarters or four years, um, contingent upon how many service quarters each played. So, for example, 
a man like David Clyde, who was only 37 game days shy of a pension, a man like Mr. Clyde uh, received a gross check for approximately $9,700. And after taxes, because Major League Baseball wasn't good enough to at least extend these men the right to uh, send them a W-4P form and tell them how many withholding deductions that they wanted taken out. So a man like Mr. Clyde probably came home with about, when all of a sudden done, $7,800, $8,000. However, that, again, that payment goes when Mr. Clyde goes. It's not a true pension. He can't pass the payment on to a loved one. I mean, and David has uh, two children. Um, there is no health insurance attached to that payment. So, again, it is not a true pension because, as you and your listeners probably know, a true pension obviously includes, uh, in 99% of the cases, health insurance and the right to pass a payment on to a designated beneficiary or a loved one. And, in fact, um, David has not been well lately. Uh, David, even though he was the number one um, pick in the amateur draft in 1973, David had was just hospitalized a couple of days before last Christmas uh, with pneumonia and had a lung operation. So health insurance is a very, very important consideration that Major League Baseball has not given these men. And yeah, I don't let, know why they haven't. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the uh, the financial aspect here because you bring up a very interesting point in the book too. Doug Gladstone, by the way, is with us this morning. His book is called "A Bitter Cup of Coffee: How MLB and the Players Association Threw 874 Retirees a Curve." You mentioned about how Doug, this is this if this were to be addressed in your mind properly, uh, it it would not be an ongoing burden. It would be a fixed cost for a fixed amount of time for Major League Baseball because, in essence, these guys about which we're speaking, they're all getting older, and I don't mean to be crass or anything like this, but they're dying off. I mean, we're all going to go the way of all flesh, right? Uh, And so this would be a cost that Major League Baseball could say, all right, this is how much this is going to cost us. It's never going to go up. Uh, We're we're going to be able to, to pay this all down in a fixed period of time. How big of a factor is that, if any? Well, Gus, ultimately... Uh, and you're not being crass, you're being pragmatic. Um, ultimately, if I had my druthers, all of these men would be retroactively restored into pension coverage, or at the very least, grandfathered uh, into it. Michael Weiner, the executive director of the Major League Baseball Players Association, says that the current crop of ball players has essentially um, taken $50 million of their slice of the pie and shifted it in uh, for these uh, players who, again, performed between 1947 and 1979. Um, The collective bargaining agreement between the league and the union was recently extended to 2016, but again, it doesn't include health insurance, and it does not include uh, designated payments being passed on to a beneficiary, to a loved one, to a wife, to a child. Um, In the ideal scenario, in the ideal scenario, uh, the pension would be, designated to a spouse and to a loved one, and these men would be allowed to have health insurance. But even if they only um, addressed the health insurance situation, even if they only addressed the health insurance situation, thus it would be far better, in my opinion, than the existing state of affairs. Doug Gladstone with us, a bitter cup of coffee. Doug, did you have a chance to talk with any current or maybe retired Major League Baseball players and find out from them what their uh, ideas are about this whole situation. And the reason I ask is because, you know, these guys that we're talking about, they're the guys that that really set the stage for the big money, you know, giant kind of game that Major League Baseball is these days. What do do current or former players think about this? Well, first of all, I agree with you. These are the men who went out on strike and who endured labor stoppages so that the, to, to give an example, uh, the Albert Pulholses and the Prince Fielders and the Jose Reyes and the Mark Burleys uh, of the world could command what most people would perceive are ridiculously obscene salaries. As far as past players go, uh, most of them didn't want to talk about it. Um, 
I, I will tell you my, my, my favorite story. Um, Lyle Overbay, Lyle Overbay used to be with the Toronto Blue Jays and the Pittsburgh Pirates. Now I believe he's with uh, the Arizona Diamondbacks. Well, Lyle Overbay's children, uh, during the offseason, they live in Centralia, Washington. And uh, they play soccer. you talking about your son and his penalty kick shootout uh, at the outset of the program. Uh, well, Lyle Overby's children play soccer with the grandsons of Darcy Fast. Now, Darcy Fast was a pitcher for the Chicago Cubs, played maybe eight or nine games uh, in 1968, and then um, decided to defend this country's freedoms and liberties, went off to Vietnam. When he came home, he got the calling. He followed in his father's footsteps, and he recently retired as the chief pastor of um, for the community church in Centralia, Washington. So here's a man um, who has defended this country's freedoms, who has given his life um, over to seeing social justice um, happen for his parishioners. And when I asked, through an intermediary, intermediary pardon me, when I asked Lyle Overbay, did he even know that his good friend, Pastor Fast, was not receiving a pension. He says, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, I think it's shocking that for the past three decades, and I don't like to generalize, but in my research for the book, I found that the reaction of a Lyle Overbay was pretty much the way things were. Most of the players did not know that the men of the past, who, again, as you well uh, stated, who literally endured labor stoppages and went without paychecks so that they could command these uh, ridiculous salaries today, uh, most of them did not or were not aware of the fact that um, there were no pensions given to these men, who a lot of people are referring to as the lost boys of baseball. Hmm. Wow, it's, it is a fascinating story. The name of the book, again, is A Bitter Cup of Coffee, How MLB and the Players Association Threw 874 Retirees a Curve. Last thing for you this morning, Doug. Are you, you know, what, what, what are your hopes? I mean, obviously, you know, we, we've heard a little bit about your thoughts and your ideas about what you would like to see happen. Uh, I don't mean to nail you down to a prediction or anything like that, but do you foresee uh, the right thing being done anytime in the near future here? Uh, no, Gus, I do not. And to be very fair, that's because Major League Baseball legally does not have to uh, bargain on behalf of of men who are not vested in the player's pension, pan, uh, player's pension fund. Um, if you and your listeners wanted, of course, to apply any kind of concerted collective pressure, uh, the people you'd want to be talking with really are the Michael Wieners of the world, um, the folks who run the Major League Baseball uh, Players Association. Uh, also in Colorado Springs, the Major League Baseball Players Alumni Association. Tell them that they're... Um, advocacy, I'm referring to the Alumni Association, needs to be stepped up a bit. And I know this sounds pretty hokey, but uh, you and your listeners could tell uh, Michael Wiener uh, and his members, the current crop of ball players, that, um, you know, <laughs> your faith without good works is, is dead faith. And um, yes, you've thrown them a bone, you've given them some money, but you could do more. You should do more. And um, I hope that when all is said and done, these men are, in fact, um, retroactively restored to pension coverage. Yeah. And, and, you know, honestly, in my humble opinion, too, Doug, it would be it would be very nice to see maybe some of the uh, current crop of, you know, very highly paid players kind of getting on board with this and saying, hey, Maybe something needs to be done about this. So we'll see where it goes. Doug, great book, great research, by the way, and thank you very much for being a part of the program this morning. I appreciate it. Gus, I want to thank you for the opportunity, and thank you and your listeners for sharing um, this part of the day with me. Have a fine day. You too. Doug Gladstone with us this morning here on Seize the Day on the Catholic Channel on Sirius XM 129. His book, again, is called A Bitter Cup of Coffee, How MLB and the Players Association Threw 874 Retirees a Curve. Fascinating stuff, and you can find that again on my website. If you go to GusLloyd.com, click on the Books tab at the top of the page, 
And uh, you can read about, again, if you're a baseball fan, you're going to love this book because it really takes you back in time to, uh, and it's filled with all kinds of very interesting stories uh, about former. 